the eldest judge leaned forward across the table, and his voice became suavely derisive. You speak as if you were fighting for some sort of principle, Mr. Reardon, but what you're actually fighting for is only your property, isn't it? Yes, of course, I am fighting for my property. Do you know the kind of principle that represents? You pose as a champion of freedom, but it's only the freedom to make money that you're after. Yes, of course, all I want is the freedom to make money. Do you know what that freedom implies? Surely, Mr. Reardon, you wouldn't want your attitude to be misunderstood. You wouldn't want to give support to the widespread impression that you are a man devoid of social conscience, who feels no concern for the welfare of his fellows and works for nothing but his own profit. I work for nothing but my own profit. I earn it. There was a gasp, not of indignation, but of astonishment in the crowd behind him, and silence from the judges he faced. He went on calmly. No, I do not want my attitude to be misunderstood. I shall be glad to state it for the record. I am in full agreement with the facts of everything said about me in the newspapers, with the facts, but not with the evaluation. I work for nothing but my own profit, which I make by selling a product they need to men who are willing and able to buy it. I do not produce it for their benefit at the expense of mine, and they do not buy it for my benefit at the expense of theirs. I do not sacrifice my interests to them, nor do they sacrifice theirs to me. We deal as equals by mutual consent to mutual advantage, and I am proud of every penny that I have earned in this manner. I am rich, and I am proud of every penny I own. I made my money by my own effort in free exchange and through the voluntary consent of every man I dealt with, the voluntary consent of those who employed me when I started, the voluntary consent of those who work for me now the voluntary consent of those who buy my product. I shall answer all the questions you are afraid to ask me openly. Do I wish to pay my workers more than their services are worth to me? I do not. Do I wish to sell my product for less than my customers are willing to pay me? I do not. Do I wish to sell it at a loss or give it away? I do not. If this is evil, do whatever you please about me according to whatever standards you hold. These are mine. I am earning my own living as every honest man must. I refuse to accept as guilt the fact of my own existence and the fact that I must work in order to support it. I refuse to accept as guilt the fact that I am able to do it and do it well. I refuse to accept as guilt the fact that I am able to do it better than most people, the fact that my work is of greater value than the work of my neighbors and that more men are willing to pay me. I refuse to apologize for my ability. I refuse to apologize for my success. I refuse to apologize for my money. If this is evil, make the most of it. If this is what the public finds harmful to its interests, let the public destroy me. This is my code, and I will accept no other. I could say to you that I have done more good for my fellow men than you can ever hope to accomplish. But I will not say it, because I do not seek the good of others as a sanction for my right to exist. Nor do I recognize the good of others as a justification for their seizure of my property or their destruction of my life. I will not say that the good of others was the purpose of my work. My own good was my purpose, and I despise the man who surrenders his. I could say to you that you do not serve the public good, that nobody's good can be achieved at the price of human sacrifice, that when you violate the rights of one man, you have violated the rights of all, and a public of rightless creatures is doomed to destruction. I could say to you that you will and can achieve nothing but universal devastation, as any looter must when he runs out of victims. I could say it, but I won't. It is not your particular policy that I challenge, but your moral premise. If it were true that men could achieve their good by means of turning some men into sacrificial animals, and I were asked to immolate myself for the sake of creatures who wanted to survive at the price of my blood, if I were asked to serve the interests of society apart from, above, and against my own, I would refuse. I would reject it as the most contemptible evil. I would fight it with every power I possess. I would fight the whole of mankind. If one minute were all I could last before I were murdered, I would fight in the full confidence of the justice of my battle and of a living being's right to exist. Let there be no misunderstanding about me. If it is now the belief of my fellow men who call themselves the public that their good requires victims, then I say the public good be damned. I will have no part of it. The crowd burst into applause. Reardon whirled around, more startled than his judges. 
He saw faces that laughed in violent excitement, and faces that pleaded for help. He saw their silent despair breaking out into the open. He saw the same anger and indignation as his own, finding release in the wild defiance of their cheering. He saw the looks of admiration and the looks of hope. There were also the faces of loose-mouthed young men and maliciously unkempt females, the kind who led the booing in newsreel theaters at any appearance of a businessman on the screen. They did not attempt a counter-demonstration. They were silent. As he looked at the crowd, people saw in his face what the threats of the judges had not been able to evoke, the first sign of emotion. It was a few moments before they heard the furious beating of a gavel upon the table and one of the judges yelling, "'Or I shall have the courtroom cleared!' As he turned back to the table, Reardon's eyes moved over the visitor's section. His glance paused on Dagny, a pause perceptible only to her, as if he were saying, It works. She would have appeared calm, except that her eyes seemed to have become too large for her face. Eddie Willers was smiling, the kind of smile that is a man's substitute for breaking into tears. Mr. Moen looked stupefied. Paul Larkin was staring at the floor. There was no expression on Bertram Scudder's face, or on Lillian's. She sat at the end of a row, her legs crossed. A mink stole slanting from her right shoulder to her left hip. She looked at Reardon, not moving. In the complex violence of all the things he felt, he had time to recognize a touch of regret and of longing. There was a face he had hoped to see, had looked for from the start of the session, had wanted to be present more than any other face around him. But Francisco d'Anconia had not come. Mr. Reardon said the eldest judge, smiling affably, reproachfully, and spreading his arms. It is regrettable that you should have misunderstood us so completely. That's the trouble that businessmen refuse to approach us in a spirit of trust and friendship. They seem to imagine that we are their enemies. Why do you speak of human sacrifices? What made you go to such an extreme? We have no intention of seizing your property or destroying your life. We do not seek to harm your interests. We are fully aware of your distinguished achievements. Our purpose is only to balance social pressures and do justice to all. This hearing is really intended not as a trial, but as a friendly discussion aimed at mutual understanding and cooperation. I, I do, do not cooperate at the point of a gun. Why speak of guns? This matter is not serious enough to warrant such references. We are fully aware that the guilt in this case lies chiefly with Mr. Kenneth Daniger, who instigated this infringement of the law, who exerted pressure upon you, and who confessed his guilt by disappearing in order to escape trial. No, we did it by equal, mutual, voluntary agreement. Mr. Reardon, said the second judge, you may not share some of our ideas, but when all is said and done, we're all working for the same cause, for the good of the people. We realize that you were prompted to disregard legal technicalities by the critical situation of the coal mines and the crucial importance of fuel to the public welfare. No, I was prompted by my own profit and my own interests. What effect it had on the coal mines and the public welfare is for you to estimate. That was not my motive. Mr. Moen stared dazedly about him and whispered to Paul Larkin, Something's gone screwy here. Oh, shut up, snapped Larkin. I am sure, Mr. Reardon, said the eldest judge, that you do not really believe, nor does the public, that we wish to treat you as a sacrificial victim. If anyone has been laboring under such a misapprehension, we are anxious to prove that it is not true. The judges retired to consider their verdict. They did not stay out long. They returned to an ominously silent courtroom and announced that a fine of five thousand dollars was imposed on Henry Reardon, but that the sentence was suspended. Streaks of jeering laughter ran through the applause that swept the courtroom. The applause was aimed at Reardon, the laughter at the judges. Reardon stood motionless, not turning to the crowd, barely hearing the applause. He stood looking at the judges. There was no triumph in his face, no elation. Only the still intensity of contemplating a vision with a bitter wonder. There was almost fear. He was seeing the enormity of the smallness of the enemy who was destroying the world. He felt as if after a journey of years through a landscape of devastation, past the ruins of great factories, the wrecks of powerful engines, the bodies of invincible men, he had come upon the despoiler expecting to find a giant, and had found a rat, eager to scurry for cover at the first sound of a human step. If this is what has beaten us, he thought, the guilt is ours. He was jolted back into the courtroom by the people pressing to surround him. 
He smiled in answer to their smiles, to the frantic, tragic eagerness of their faces. There was a touch of sadness in his smile. "'God bless you, Mr. Reardon,' said an old woman with a ragged shawl over her head. "'Can't you save us, Mr. Reardon? They're eating us alive, and it's no use fooling anybody about how it's the rich that they're after. Do you know what's happening to us?' "'Listen, Mr. Reardon,' said a man who looked like a factory worker. "'It's the rich who are selling us down the river. Tell those wealthy bastards who are so anxious to give everything away that when they give away their palaces, they're giving away the skin off our backs.' "'I know it,' said Reardon. 